Hi, everybody. Welcome to Universal Archetype Experiences. And hi to all of you watching us from all over the world. I am delighted to open up this workshop to be back teaching. I really miss teaching. You know, COVID really dampened my, uh, well, it, it just was hard. It's not the same to teach online. Not that I don't love it, but it's not the same. I just love to interact with everybody. I want to open up the workshop tonight by describing why I chose the subject that I did. Uh, it's, it's important for me to communicate that with you because the one thing I know I cannot return, I can return your money, but I cannot return the time you're giving me. So I am incredibly mindful that every hour of your life that you have given me this week is the most precious thing you have. Time is our most precious commodity. And at this stage in my life, I have reached a point where how I formulate my workshops comes from a long history of having a multiple layered career as a medical intuitive and a teacher and a writer. And now what do I want to give to you that empowers you? that just doesn't teach you, but actually empowers you. And my, my work has led me to um, the, the realm of mystical experiences. And now that I'm 70, hmm. I can't frigging believe it. But anyway, but you know what the wonder is of that? I now don't edit myself the way I used to. And you used to think I wasn't edited before, but you know. But now I say, I will share what I have experienced as a way of sharing with you why I teach what I do. You mentioned evil. Yeah, it's, it's a very real uh, presence in our world, and we'll get to that. In fact, I'm writing a book on it. So I want to start by actually telling you I made notes, which for me, <laughs> because I'm always over the, I'm all over the place. And I've decided that I have to curtail myself. And the reason is because I want to teach so many things and I have to kind of put a bit in my mouth. Um, the first thing I want to do is share this illustration because we're going to be using it constantly. And what I have done, I've used it before many, many, many times. But what, what I've done finally is I'm taking the time to articulate what consciousness is on each of these inner floors that we have. So what this building represents is that when you're born, you are a structure. And there are certain things about your structure that can't be changed. Where you're born, when you're born, um, the time you're born. And I want you to think about that as the structure of your building. So, that's, so the building is locked in concrete. And once that building's been downloaded onto the earth, the movement is essentially up the floors. And so what these floors represent is the altitude through which you want to view the dynamics that are your life. Do you want to see it from the penthouse? Or do you want to see it from the first floor? In this choice, we are all identical. And just like living in a, in a, in a high rise, every floor gives you a huge, a much different view of the same address that you were living in. So you don't change your address. You don't change the, where you were born, who you are, but you change your capacity to understand what's going on. You widen the view. You widen the view. And as you get up, what is true, and this is the truth, as you rise up in floors, 
it becomes more expensive to live at a higher altitude. I don't mean that physically. I don't mean money. I mean it becomes more expensive to your psyche and soul. It becomes more difficult for you to get to a higher floor, as I'll describe. It also becomes more difficult for you to share with others what a higher floor inner life is like. At some point, here's a difference. In the lower floors, you are always asking, what's going on in my life? What's going on in my life? What's the purpose of my? So the word my is a big deal down here. Eventually, you're going to drop that word my. And you will say, what is the purpose of life? So you'll start to expand the questions that you are asking of the universe. You'll begin to include others in your framework and in your decision making. Down here, all you care about is yourself. What's this going to cost me? Da -da -da -da, your own survival. We, as a species, have to mature in our thinking and in the size of our capacity and the size of our heart to include other people in our calculations. We start with people we know, children, family. But it takes a great deal of evolution to include in your calculations people you don't know just because we share the planet with them. Just because we share the planet with them. Just because one of the things we're going to deal with is the myst are the mystical laws. Because up here is the, the consciousness where you actually start to recognize what is in one is in the whole. Down to your cell tissues. What is in one of your cell tissues is in the whole of your body. If I take any one of them, I'm going to get your DNA. If one of your cell tissues goes rogue and becomes malignant, it can take down your whole body. The way the universe works is that your, the, in, the map of the entire universe is in you. All the truths that God has ever taught, that Buddha has ever taught, that Jesus ever taught, that, that Islam ever taught, are actually in our bio-spiritual ecology. What is in one is in the whole. Now, all of you have begun to experience that truth by the way you now handle an illness. All of you are now accustomed to going to a doctor, and wanting to be treated holistically. So the holistic model has downloaded into you. But what we have done is we do not apply that holism to anything else. We don't think, hmm, if this is the way my body works, I wonder if this is the way the universe works. We don't do that. We don't do that. We haven't gone that far. We haven't yet seen the world through that lens. But it's time. But it's time. Wait a minute. Who took my notes? Ah, what I want to do is, if, if, if you remember, when I described this workshop, I did a lot, I gave a lot of examples. These are all the notes for this. We've got to get through, but we will do it. Um, I said there are archetypal experiences that I want to describe that are common to all of us. The journey of empowerment, the, the need to... Um, the mystery of health, 
they need to understand the holistic, the holism of your health, um, the laws of nature in your cell tissue, your multidimensional life. All of these are now archetypal dynamics that are common to all of your lives. How they play out, how they play out is, depends on what floor you're on. Depends on whether you live in the literal world or you have managed to make your way up to where you can comprehend symbolism. Now I'm going to take this apart for us over the next couple of days. But just as a beginning, what's going on in the world now? Okay, what's going on? So, <clears throat> on the first floor, <clears throat> the first floor of our lives is where you take everything literally. It's the first floor of survival. I'll go into bigger detail starting tomorrow morning. But for this evening, when I want you to picture yourself in a building I want you to look out the first floor. How far can you see? Just across the street of that. So you have very limited vision, which means that your capacity to be frightened is very high. Because you can't see the world around you, nor can you comprehend very much. So there's a real good chance that you're more afraid of the world around you because you don't know it, you can't see it, and there's a real good chance that the way you want everything explained to you is going to be very simple. Two plus two is four, right? Right. That for you, this is the reason why I don't do medical intuitive readings anymore. Is because the more I did readings, I'm just going to take a moment and tell you this because it relates to this. When I started out, I didn't know anything about medical intuition. You have no idea. I, I mean, I, was, I, I, I went to school to be a, a, a theologian and to be a writer, and, and, and you develop a skill that you didn't even know existed. And then I met Norm Sheely and so on and so forth. But when I started out, I started out with doing intuitive readings, and all I knew at that time was that, it, in the 80s, was that the attitude with people was that illness was caused by negativity. That was a very popular attitude back then. So I thought, okay, works for me. And when I would do readings, I didn't know anything about anatomy, I didn't know anything about nothing, zero. Um, my first reading with Norm, I said, this man has, his esophagus feels like concrete. The guy had throat cancer. I, I couldn't, I didn't even see esophagus. Um, and it was good. It was a blessing because I wasn't able to, um, project anything or use my medic, quote, medical knowledge to say this can't be. I just took, took everything that I got as an impression and I took it to be the actual thing. In the beginning, I went after where you were ill and why. And I went after it like from the first floor, which is one reason, had to be one reason, because that seemed to be the model, that for everything that went wrong, there was one reason, okay? As, and then, most people came from the mentality that if you could figure out the one reason, then God would reward me with my health because then I would make it right. So that's when I realized that people had a real link to this idea that there's an off-planet God who behaves like a daddy, who punishes you when things go wrong, and that you, most people believe somewhere in their spiritual DNA 
that if they're a good person, bad things shouldn't happen to them. Now that is a basic first, second floor idea of God. It's not real, but people cling to that, and they will fight to the death over this God. I give you Israel. Gaza. People will fight to death over these ideas. They're not true. Okay? And what people want are the simplest explanation for why bad things happen. And so when I was doing readings, here's a person who's in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 40s, and they think one trauma from their childhood is the reason why here, decades later, decades later, they have fallen apart. Connected to one trauma. What about all the negative things they did before? What about things that weren't negative that are affecting them? What about, as I learned years later, when I was able to comprehend this, you're being influenced by lives you have yet to live. Okay? I couldn't see it then. But, but eventually, this model of one thing for one thing didn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense. But it was what we want on the first floor of our lives. The simplest explanation, the fastest. And so when we, we look at the problems of the world, we look and we walk out the street and we say, it must be their fault, it must be their fault. That's all there is to it. Now, as you, in your own life, as, as we will work in this workshop, with every floor you go up in your consciousness, what you are actually doing is negotiating your relationship with time, space, light, aging. You are actually negotiating. You are moving into timelessness. Kairos time. Oh, yeah, I'll say it many times. But here's a simple, actually, here's a simple Kairos. Yeah, yeah, here. This is Kronos, and this is Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. Okay, this is, we'll call it present time. Present time. And this is hour by hour, minute by minute. Now, what happens is, as you go up in consciousness, you begin to move the dial. Okay? Someone like Jesus, someone like, well, mostly Jesus, because his, his whole role here was about healing, he lived fully in present time. What does that mean? It means that when he dealt with healing, he healed without any time involved. He said, you're healed. So he healed at the speed of light, translated at the speed of God. God is light, love, and law. So he healed at the speed of God. Done. There was no matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, weighing him down. What we're going through here are the levels of what Buddha would call illusion that we cling to, that we think are real. And what that creates in us is psychic weight, W-I-G-H-T, and that equals weight, time. That's how you create time. The more you hang on to, because eventually in my work, I wrote why people don't heal. And I had to look at what, what, what makes people not heal. How come some people heal faster? How come some people, what, what is this relationship here? Right? 
eventually I realized that it, it wasn't about anything more than power, the way we manage our power. Everything is about power. The way you manage Every single thing you do, say, think, feel, where is a power calculation. Absolutely everything. There isn't one thing you do that isn't a power calculation. Not a thing. Not a thing. Everything is. Someone goes like this. I've gutted you. How long, how long did that take? Gutted you. Like this. That's all it takes. Okay? Power calculation. Right? This is the world what Buddha would say is an illusion. That's how fast we lose power. That's how fast. And what Buddha says is, this world's a big illusion. You've got to learn not to attach yourself to what that person thinks of you, to thinking that that person has any power over you. You, these are the things we're going to go through. What are your attachments that causes you and these mythologies that if I'm a good person, bad things won't happen to me? What happens when they do? And how do you know what a bad thing is? It's just a thing. It's just a thing. It's the same way when we want explanations for something. And from our first floor, we decide that the way we will organize the power in our life is we will decide who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Those are the good guys, these are the bad guys, and that's all there's to it. That's all there's to it. And that allows you to organize your power and your narratives. If I were to say to you, look, this is just going to be real fast. Get in the elevator and get up here. <laughs> and to get you up here, I have to get you out of your bodies and who you are. I have to get you out. You can't have any attachment to your history, to where you came from, to what you believe. The journey up your floors is going to strip you of everything you think you are. I won't even let you have an opinion. You're not even entitled. You're not entitled to anything and certainly not an opinion. But, it's, but in order for you to access this, this is where you are in your immortality. And you are able... To, to comprehend, to engage with what is going on in terms of human evolution. You are able to engage in looking at life without judgment, without the lens of who's right, who's wrong. Rather through the lens of a cosmic lens without judgment, that what is taking place in this moment in time, in this moment in time, you're able to engage with elements you never, ever bring to the table when you do your own thinking. Cosmic size elements. To it. <clears throat> We entered the nuclear age, not far from here. In 1945, okay, down here on the first floor, this is where your bedroom is. Human beings were sleeping in 1945, 1944, when they split the atom. The mentality in, in the first floor is incapable, incapable of including the cosmos in your thinking, of including mythology, symbology. It's incapable. You have to earn that altitude. Incapable. 
But up here, if I had you over the earth, you would see in that second that the earth shifted on its axis. That everything human beings believed up until that moment was wiped out. That in that second, what happened was not just the splitting of the atom, but every atom in you split. That everything we believed to be real up until that moment was wiped off and replaced by a reality that up until that point, no one even knew about, which was the reality of energy. From that point on, the invisible world, invisible, would begin to have dominion over the physical world. Now, in what other universe does that happen? Mystics. That's what the mystics have been screaming for thousands of years. But now we have scientists who are saying energy is conscious. Conscious. Mystics have said that forever. They don't believe them. But the scientists have said that. But we also did something. We unleashed the capacity to destroy ourselves. That is the greatest cosmic sin a society could ever do. Now, <clears throat> what happened to human nature? Deep in our unconscious, it was like human nature had to move forward in its own evolution because we lacked the moral compass. We lacked the moral compass to engage with the power of destruction that we had discovered. And what's worse is the appetite with which we wanted to use it. Okay? And so it's like evolution, the intelligence of evolution had to trigger within us our own nuclear consciousness. And so what was born within the 40s and 50s and 60s was this idea of consciousness. That we had to pursue something. That we had to pursue this something greater in ourselves. And it would require a great deal. It would require that we progress out of our ordinary form of being five sensory. We would have to become multi-sensory. We would have to open our nuclear consciousness. We would have to become whole, holistic. We would have to become a planetary community. We would have to become a conscious species. And so it put us on fast forward here. Now when these events if you come up here and start looking at global events through that lens, through that lens, what does it take to move us into a global community but confront everything that prevents it? Are you with me? The way the universe works, we're going to go into the mystical laws. The nature of God is law. There is no off-planet God that looks like us. Are you aware? There is no God that has a religion. If you want a religion, have one, but there's no God that has a religion. Get the proportions straight. There is no God that is a Catholic or is Jewish, is Muslim, nothing. There's only the, the, the divine force. If you, want to, if you want a religion, have a religion, I don't care. But don't think that your God has that religion. Don't go there. That's what gets people in trouble. That's what's getting us in trouble. Okay. But that's the kind of illusion that needs to get broken down now. 
or we'll never be one planet. The way the universe works, the way God works, the way heaven works, heaven is law and order. There's law and order in your body. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a heartbeat that you could count on. It should be this. Menopause is law. Puberty is law. Our biology is governed by law. We are systems of law. The universe is mathematics. Everything is ordered, and so is the power of choice. We are governed by mystical laws. When we make choices, we are held accountable. We are held accountable for the consequence of those choices. How that accountability plays out is not something I grasp. All I know is we are held accountable in some vast way. I don't know. But up here, I want you out of yourself, out, out, out. I want you to just think that you are viewing something without any kind of judgment in you. That what we are living right now is a time of accountability in which a lot of patterns that have been a lot of psychic patterns need to be healed and completed. Hold on there. In your own life, you know that you have psychic patterns in your family. And you can't move forward until they're healed. Agreed? There is no difference. What is in one is in the whole. We have planetary psychic patterns that prevent us from moving forward. What does... What do you do when you want to stop something from moving forward? For example, wait a minute, it's, it's so dry here, do you not think? Mm. If someone, if you have children, and you're, you're um, for example, my, my, my niece, I'm very close to my niece, and she, she comes home and she shaves half her head, And you have to go, right? Because I think it looks, right. But you have to pick your battlefields, yeah? You have to pick your battlefields. I'm not going to die on that hill with her, so. But I'm very, t I had to say to myself, it's not unless she starts tampering and making choices that I think can do damage to her heart or her mind, that I'm going to step in. But what do you do when you step in? What you do, and this is up here, this is a mystical truth. You try to reverse, you try to slow down the speed at which someone's progressing. That's called fundamentalism. You send them back to fundamentals. You will say, give me that phone. Give me the keys to your car. What you are doing is you're playing with time and space and speed. And so you take all the instruments of energy that they have so you can slow down the speed at which they're progressing. Now, we are in an accelerated world. And we've all been downloaded with this kind of template that says we are progressing. We need to become one planet. We have, we have entered the galactic community. So we are joining the galactic community. We need to become a human community. And we need to become incapable of thinking that the way to solve our problems is through killing each other. That, that, that that's the solution. In order for that to happen, right, we need to progress into ideas that we've never thought about before, solutions we've never considered before. But there are those that don't want that, and they go back to fundamentals, and they go back to down here. So we have a rise in fundamentalism 
just as we have a rise at the same time in the progressive. And you could think of it as a rise in fossil thinking, right? Fossil fuels, just as we have a rise in solar, S-O-U-L-A-R and S-O-L-A-R. So these are, and from up here, without looking at whose side, because quite frankly, whether it was Israel or Palestine, whether it was Ukraine or, and, and Russia, it up here, if you really get what I'm saying to you, it doesn't matter who's picking up the fight. It is human beings picking up the fight that says, I don't, I, I still believe that killing is the way to solve problems. It doesn't matter whose side. Okay. But, in, but what, if we look at what's going on in Israel, you have to add this factor, which is that it's the end of the Abrahamic religions. They are getting dismantled. Someone was saying to me just the other day, or was it at lunch? I can't remember. That people aren't going to church anymore and blah, 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 blah. And I wasn't about to launch into my, I just thought, mm -hmm. But of course they're not going. Of course they're not going. And that's because the churches, the nature, these off-planet gods that follow these mythologies of religion are getting dismantled, and that's going to continue. And the mythology that these Abrahamic religions all share is that they each believe they're the chosen people. And they will fight to the death to prove that. No, I'm chosen. No, I'm chosen. No, I'm chosen. And that's part of this myth. And this is what happens when human beings decide that the universe belongs to them instead of we belong to the universe. This is what happens when people claim that they are special in some way to the universe that other human beings are not. No, we're more special. No, we're more special. We will all pay the price for this. We are all the same. And what, in order for us to reach this place of planetary community, we've got to stop that. And I don't know that we're going to get through this passage. But what I intend to do is take each of you into that part of yourself that is struggling. So if you can sense the struggle in yourself, you can sense the struggle in the world. But I tell you the truth. If you can change it in yourself, you have changed the world. And that, too, is a mystical truth. If you can change one part of this struggle in yourself, then you have contributed more light than you will ever, ever know. And I actually believe that we are living at a time when all of us are being drafted into the light or the dark. So that everything we do actually matters, matters more than you can. You can't comprehend it down here because down here you still measure the significance of your life by size, weight, what it looks like in money. You have no idea that up here, the size and power of your life deals with how well you manage your soul. The more light you channel, the more you transform the world. But getting, getting people to the point, getting you to a place where you start trusting that, that the greatest thing I can do right now is to channel love 
is the channel of not schmaltzy Hallmark crap, but rather compassion. Just, I will not judge this situation. I will pray for it. Just download it with grace. To get to this point where all things are part of evolution, and I will not jump in there and say, these people are horrible, these people are horrible, these people. I will learn from the spiritual masters that say, do you really think more killing is going to end the killing? Do you actually think that? For centuries, the great spiritual masters have said, if you want to stop the killing, then you stop the killing. Simple as that. Stop it. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these floors, and you're going to go through yourself as I go through these floors. And then we're going to talk about these archetypal experiences because they will play out on whichever floor your consciousness is on. Because that's the way God's dis- that's the way the universe is designed. So that if you if you the universe will you will experience something on the floor where your consciousness is, if you need it at the physical level. Look, I'll give you an example. How many times people will go in to a room, they'll come home to their family, and they'll say, what's going on here? And you get an intuitive hit. Maybe the intuitive hit is, you know, your, your kids stealing cars or something like that, right? Hanging out with Martians, who knows? All right. And you think, oh my God, that's can't be. I don't want it to be that. So what you do here, you get a hit. A hit is a light bolt. Don't we often say we've been hit by lightning? That's the metaphor we use. But you think, oh no, I don't want to deal with Martians. That's not happening. Okay. So what you do is you draw up another narrative for yourself. Now, really, what's really going on is. He's, he, he, his shoes are too tight. You start telling yourself something else. And what you're actually doing is creating psychic weight to slow down the speed of the consequences of what's really going on. Can you say that again? You want to slow down the speed of real, realizing the consequences of your son hanging out with Martians. So you tell yourself it's really Martians. And now what you do is no matter what he's doing, you interpret it through this nonsensical story you're telling yourself. He starts eating ice cream all the time. That's because he's really, he's, he really just doesn't want to, um, no, it's not, he's, de- he's, he's demartianizing. Whatever nonsense you tell yourself, you will tell yourself so that you don't have to face the fact. Maybe he's an addict. Whatever. You don't want to. So what you're doing is you're buying time. Denial, deception, and what you then do is you start screening your friends. You'll only hang out with people who will absolutely endorse your narrative. Only hang out with people who endorse your narrative because you can't afford to have someone hit the truth light. They'll say, no, I actually think he's with Martians. You can't afford that. So what you do is you have a temper tantrum and you get mad at them and you push them away. You're not supportive of me. Yep, 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 yep. And that's what people do. And, what, and then what happens is one day, your son comes home in a spaceship, lands on the roof, and this light bulb-headed creature walks in your house. And then what do you say? I knew it all the time. 
So now you, but now what you do is you turn and you admit that you, that the speed of light got to you. And where do you think illness comes from? It comes from you tampering with the speed of light in you. That's where disease comes from. That's where madness comes from. That's where anxiety comes from. Because when you start tampering with the speed of light in you, and you decide to matterize, to take light and densify it with a false narrative, it takes a lot of effort for you to create ongoing lies. And it is the most toxic thing you can do. Well, one of them. Okay? And so you're creating, and, 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 as you go up this, the floors in your building, you start understanding how the laws work. And it means you have to live by the laws. And so when you get hit with the light, you have to respond to it. You don't get to create a narrative anymore. You don't get to lie to yourself. And what that does is it changes the speed at which you start comprehending things. So you start moving faster on your inner world than people you live with. Now, just as an aside, part of what we have to talk about is why the development of your inner soul self-esteem is so important. Because as you are able to perceive what others cannot see, you cannot still be so weak in your self-esteem that you need approval. You cannot. You cannot go to people and think, I saw this, do you, do you think it's possible? You think, why me, am I going crazy? No, stop it. That's why this development of yourself has to happen as a, as a package. You know what I realized, like, in healing? Like, how come people, more people don't heal instantly or more rapidly? Why do they heal at the first floor, the speed of time where your bottle says, take this for six weeks, which means you're going to be sick for six weeks? It says right here, I will be sick for six weeks. Whereas as you go up, because you're really shedding illusions, you're changing your relationship to the speed of, of, of a choice and a consequence. A miracle. What, what, what's a miracle? A miracle, even, even Jesus, who was famous for miracles, the most famous for miracles, would say, I, you can do this if you get what I'm doing. I'm teaching you the law. Stop being razzle-dazzled by this. Get how the laws work. That was his message. Get how the laws work. I'm working with light instead of matter. That's what he would always say. Your, 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 your faith healed you at the speed of light. And I knocked the history out of your cell tissue. Okay? But what I realized is most people do not have the power to let, or the self-esteem or the courage to let their lives change at the speed of light. They just don't have it. They can't do it. They absolutely can't do it. That in fact, that, that they need their life to change at a much lower speed. Even when the possibility is that they could change at the speed of light and they don't have the self-esteem yet to be given an experience like a miracle which is an experience that is completely subjective. In many cases, you can't prove that, that you can't prove a miracle. It either is or it isn't. There's a whole big you know, office in Rome that's all about studying miracles and investigating, right? But what if someone came up to you and said, I can't believe you were even ever sick. And you didn't have the stamina to withstand the, the onslaught 
of people who don't have faith. All it would do is create another disease in you. Rage. You have to be able to handle the fact that people don't believe and don't understand the speed of a miracle, of what a miracle is, and that, that, that heaven can bend the laws just for you. Okay, yeah. You, you just said in your uh, sheet about the phoenix simulation arise from the ash. The phoenix will rise from the ash. This is strong. This is very strong. Strong. Wait a minute. Beth is going to use a, a, a microphone if you don't mind. Hello. Mm -hmm. You have to talk into it for a minute. It was on. You have to turn, you have to talk into it. How come we always go through this? Just out of curiosity. How are we doing? We're done in five. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Hello, okay. Hello, darling. I'm Vanya from Brazil. And it's so strong what you put in, in uh, your formulation in your course about the phoenix. Phoenix. Um, yeah. And humiliation arises from the ash. And yes. I think. Is about this. Yes. Yeah. You go up if you go through the humiliation and everything. But the phoenix, what what the phoenix is, the phoenix to the ashes is the law of death. It is the mystical law of the cycle of life. But the reason I love I love it, love it, love it, love it so much is because it's also this is how God works. It is also the promise that you will, you will fall because that's just how you learn. But I promise you, I promise you, you will rise from the ashes. It's built into the system. And here's the thing. The universe builds these law, gives you this promise that even if you don't believe, even if you are a horrible person, even if you are this, that, and the other, it doesn't matter. You were, the Phoenix is a promise. Because the nature of the universe is, it is not personal, it is not emotional, it is not any of that, but it's deeply intimate. There isn't a thing you do that's not known, not a prayer is not heard, but it is all law. Which means we will have our Phoenix, Phoenix experiences, but it's not, per there's nothing in this. This is as we go up, you finally get that there's nothing in the universe that's personal, though we have a personal experience of it. This earth was not created for us, but we're here. So we have a personal experience of this earth in, in the 2000s, but it wasn't created for us. This is divine paradox. Motherhood wasn't created for you, but many of you are mothers. But there's nothing personal about pregnancy until you have your personal experience of it, but it wasn't created for you. There is nothing about life that was created for any of us, but we were given life. And so the way we start navigating our choices and our decisions is we start realizing things, all sorts of things are destined to happen to us. Betrayal, abandonment, it's not personal. Now we can take it personally, and when we do, we create psychic weight and we anchor ourselves. And we start telling ourselves narratives that are simply not true. But they support us because here on the first floor, we want to punish someone. We want to make someone feel bad. We want to, we want to just make them, oh, you horrible person. But you don't realize that you are hemorrhaging. It's not them. You don't get it you don't get the consequences of that decision. You don't get it. That the higher you go up, the more you real you see it archetypally like, for God's sake, here I am again. In a relationship, it was my rescuer that got into this relationship with this 
rescuee, I did it again. It's not personal. And in fact, the rescuee was scheduled to leave me because, and this is if you got to get this, because it really wasn't love. It was rescue juice. Okay? And the more I learn this, the more I will discover what love is. My God, I owe that guy a thank you note. <laughs> and that is as you go up, you finally get it. We're all in this together. And what we're really doing is the it, our true acts of profound love that when down here are so vile and so ugly at times, you can't get it. And the only way you get through the vile and the ugly, the only way I'm telling you is on your knees and in prayer because there are times when you have to say, if you think I can forgive this, you better think again. So you better take charge of my heart because I'm about to lose it. You got to pray big. You got to pray big and you got to own your rage, but not to another person. Take it where it belongs. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting dinner workshop. Okay, dinner signals. This is going to be our workshop. And I, I'm so glad you're here, and thank you for joining us. And that is all for this evening. It's time for dinner.